Welcome to Rails to Trails Conservancy's webinar on navigating congressional earmarks. I'm Kevin Mills, Vice President of Policy at RTC. My guests today are Jim Cole, a partner at Summit Strategies with deep expertise on transportation funding and finance, who served as the staff director to the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2007 to 2014. We've got Hal Heemstra, a founding partner of Summit Strategies with decades of experience in transportation policy, including securing numerous earmarks for clients. And we have Marianne Fowler, a senior strategist at RTC with decades of federal affairs leadership in the trails community, including running a highly successful earmarking campaign to support trail biking and walking projects in Safety Lou, the last reauthorization in which earmarks were allowed. Before we jump into the earmarks discussion, I will note a breaking news story. President Biden will speak this afternoon about his administration's jobs plan that includes major infrastructure investments. An outline of the plan released this morning aims at really big goals, jobs, equity, climate. And these are things that Trails and Active Transportation can make important contributions to. The plan includes opportunities for active transportation, investing in safer streets for pedestrians and cyclists, reconnecting neighborhoods divided by historic transportation investments and improving transit and climate resilience. For the plan to succeed in achieving its goals, the administration and Congress will need to get explicit about one more critical thing, investing in walking and biking routes to reduce driving and provide equitable mobility. So in the last month, we've seen the launch of two separate house earmarking processes, one at the Appropriations Committee, and another with the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Today's webinar is your chance to ask questions of experts about how the earmarking process will work with an emphasis on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee process as it presents a strategic opportunity to make the case for both direct funding for an iconic project for your community, as well as necessary policy changes that will enable you to sustain efforts over time to build connected trail and active transportation networks within and between communities. A round of earmarks without better policies, like the Connecting America's Active Transportation System Act, will not sustain a pipeline of projects to provide safe walking and biking routes to connect people to the places they wish to go. Your best strategy is to engage your member of Congress to advance an earmark for a key to the resource page, and the, and the URL for that will be in the chat that will help you with this advocacy. So now I'm gonna to turn to Jim Cole to address the nuts and bolts of the earmarking process. We will take audience questions for Jim in just a minute. So you're encouraged to submit your questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, you can do that at any time at this point. And then, um, and then at the bottom of the hour, Jim will need to leave us and we'll continue the discussion with Hale Heemstra and Marianne Fowler who will be addressing the politics of earmarking and reauthorization. So Jim, uh, why are there two separate earmarking processes and uh, why might there be advantages to the applicant to be looking at the transportation and infrastructure committee process in particular? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, well, I mean, just like, you know, in, in um, the legislative process, there's two separate uh, processes. One is for authorizing committees to uh, actually authorize legislation, as well as then the appropriations process, which is, you know, where discretionary funds are divided up and provided to um, various activities throughout the government. Transportation is a little unique in the sense that um, the authorization process actually provides real dollar amounts um, directly from the federal aid highway, or, I'm sorry, directly from the, the, the uh, highway trust fund um, for the earmarks that would be included in an authorized bill, um, you know, so unlike other programs where you might get an earmark in an authorization, you would then have to go to the appropriations process in order to get the dollars or the money to actually move forward with that earmark. Um, in a surface transportation reauthorization, uh, the, the earmark in an authorization bill will be funded directly out of the highway trust fund. So, you know, for transportation, you, you basically have two tracks. The first is the appropriations bill. Um, in this case, we're talking specifically about the THUD, the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development um, subcommittee um, process to provide community uh, projects, uh, as well as the, the, um, 
the FAST Act reauthorization moving forward, it was called last year, um, process that will provide earmarks for um, eligible highway and transit projects. Yeah, so maybe pivot with that. Uh, people are wondering what kinds of projects are eligible, right? For instance, does it need to be on the official plan? What, what how, do, how does that work? Yeah, um, you know, in the past, it's been a little bit wide open. Of course, let me step back a little bit. Um, the last time there's been earmarks in an authorization bill was Safety Lou in 2005. Um, I, a lot of people refer to that bill as the Wild West. There, there frankly weren't any rules, um, which in some ways contributed to the, the prohibition on earmarking moving forward in 2010. Um, so I think this year they definitely are looking to create parameters um, on the, the projects, the member uh, projects, both in the appropriations bill as well as in the authorization bill to make sure that you have projects that are gonna be currently eligible for federal aid um, highway funding as well as federal transit funding. Um, they wanna make sure that these are projects that are local priorities. So they want them to be in the, 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 the tip or the stip or have some certification from uh, the MPO um, that the, the project could be added to the tip and stip um, and that that phase, whatever that activity is, whether it be the planning piece or construction, um, that they, that we will actually be able to see it move forward um, during the life of, of the bill or in relatively short order. They don't have specific time frames, but what they don't want to see is, frankly, a lot of projects like we saw, particularly in Safety Lou, where members earmark projects that were not local priorities, um, the state DOT or whoever the project sponsor had no interest in moving that project forward. They sat on the books for years um, and eventually had to come back in and uh, rescind the dollars or reprogram the dollars so that they would actually spend out. So they wanna make sure that they have real projects that are gonna move forward. So they're gonna be looking for information related to, as I mentioned, you know, the tip or the stip, are you in there? Could you be in there? You know, what phase you're looking at? Um, what is your status of the environmental review process right now? Do you have that local support? Have you received federal funds? You know, will you be able to fully fund this project with this additional, you know, federal earmark? So they're really um, trying to make sure that they have projects that are gonna move forward. Um, and again, they don't have specific timelines um, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure as we go on, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but they definitely don't want projects that are just gonna sit there on a wish list and may or may not move forward. Yeah, you, you mentioned project phases. Can you say a little more about that? I mean, it, it, can these be planning projects, engineering projects, right of way acquisition, construction, Yeah, all, all of that? Yeah, I mean, anything within the project phase you know, the project development phase, construction phase, all the way through um, are, would be eligible. So, um, you know, they, they in, you know, in, if you've got a big project and you're gonna get a small earmark, um, it, you know, it's unlikely you're gonna actually get that project to completion. So if you focus on maybe the planning piece, it's a much smaller dollar amount, you're gonna be able to see that planning piece move forward. So then you're, you're positioned to move into the next phase of the project, all things that are going to have to happen um, to actually complete a project and have it operational. Yeah. So we've gotten a related question about how shovel ready a project needs to be. So if we're talking about a construction project, how, how close does it need to be to uh, to be successful? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking construction, I think you're really going to have to have your environmentals completed. Um, you're going to have or or near completed. I don't know. Again, there's no specific time frames, but and I think that's why they're asking that question. I mean, if you've gone through a public process and you're really just waiting on your your final EIS or you know CADEX, whatever kind of whatever you know your environmental process you're going through, I think they're going to want to see it pretty close um, so that you know you've done a lot of that initial work so that you can get to construction again in relatively short order. I mean, I think we're stepping away from the whole concept that we saw for those that remember the American Recovery Act, um, where you had a 60 day timeline to get to construction and it led to a lot of kind of small projects resurfacing on the highway area um, and things just so the state DOTs could get that money out. I think they want to, they don't necessarily want to repeat that so they don't have specific timelines, but I, I, they definitely want to see these dollars spend in the project or the activity that's going to be receiving funding move forward 
um, again, in a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. So a uh, question I wonder is whether this is, a, this is an urban thing or whether uh, earmarks could also go to rural projects. Yeah, no, they, you know, the, 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 the earmarks, you know, all member, every member of Congress has been invited to submit their, their project requests uh, both to the appropriations committee as well as the the T and I committee on the House side, um, so you know, so long as they meet the criteria that they're in the tip or the stip and um, they're eligible for Title Twenty Three or uh, Chapter Fifty Three of Title Forty Nine dollars, um, you know, they could be in urban or rural areas. Um, it's it's really just a matter of that member bringing it forward. Um, and, and you know, requesting that these dollars be included, I don't see any reason that they would exclude members who have um, submitted project requests from not receiving any dollars. So, if you have a, a, a rural member asking for it, it, there's no reason that they wouldn't potentially receive, depending on what other request the member has, um, receive funding. Yeah, it would seem if this is uh, done by each member of Congress, you're going to have. Plenty from rural districts who are looking to bring yep. rural interests forward. That's going to be the nature of this, of yes. this process. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to make the point that you know, they the, just in terms of you know the member actually requesting. Again, they've invited every member. Whether or not every member chooses to do it, uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, but it, both Democrats and Republicans have said that they're going to be you know moving, you know, including um, or allowing members to make the request and not opposing bills or banning members from trying to seek these funds. Uh, so, you know, you, you know, the members are going to have to submit, but that said, there's no limit on what, how many projects on the authorizing side they can actually submit um, to the, to the committee. Um, and the one thing and I think, you know, Hal and, and Marianne are going to talk about this later, but um, they want the members to rank their projects, their top five projects. So if a member comes in with 20, they're going to rank their top five. Now, they haven't said they're only going to pick from the members top five. So it's not clear how that plays out. But um, but they, you know, they members are going to have a process by which to put as many projects in as they want on the authorizing side and then, um, you know, rank their priorities. Got it. So next question is about the size of a project that one pursues, right? Is there an ideal dollar range to seek? Well, I think there's, you know, going back to the theme of there's a lot of unanswered questions. It's not clear at this point exactly um, how much of the authorizing bill, I'll touch on approaches here in a second, um, that they plan to set aside for earmarks. Um, which obviously that will drive, you know, depending on how many members submit and how much is available, um, what the overall size of the pot members will have to earmark and of that, how much each member will get to earmark. So I think that will, you know, leaves a lot of unanswered questions to, and this is something we've heard quite a bit. Um, the one thing, you know, kind of rumors um, that are out there that we've heard is that, you know, they're looking anywhere between maybe 10 to $20 million per member. Um, so it remains, you know, we'll have to see and depends how many members ask for projects and how many, you know, how, what types of projects they're looking for. Um, but I don't think there's a, you know, it's not necessarily a question of how much is the right amount. I think it's really how, you know, can you advance that project or that phase of the project with the earmark that you're requesting? Um, that's really going to be, I think, a driver for the projects that the committees, you know, will will decide to include in the final bill. Um, so it really depends on what that cost of that activity that you're hoping to accomplish will be um, that will drive it. Now, the other thing, just quickly touching on the appropriations committee, it's a little less clear. What they have said is that they are going to earmark one percent of the total discretionary spending. Um, in the government. Um, so that's across all 12 appropriations bills. Um, not clear how they're going to div divide it up within the committees, the subcommittees within approps. Um, so there's probably less clarity there, how that's going to play out and how they're going to end up, 
you know, di dividing it up amongst members, um, how much they will actually receive um, of that 1% of the total discretionary spending. Mm -hmm. So uh, next question is, if a project has gotten money from the transportation alternatives program, and they want to get an earmark to expand that project, would, is there any issue there? How would how should somebody go about thinking about that? No, scenario? in fact, it, I mean, they don't make a statement, but they do want to know how if they've received federal funding in the past. So I think in some ways it might even be beneficial, particularly if this is that piece that might get this project over, over the finish line in terms of being able to actually move forward um, and do construction. So there's no prohibition in, in, in combining and using other federal funds um, to move it forward. And um, in some ways it may be beneficial if, if this is, you know, kind of that last piece that will help move the project, um, you know, into the next phase or into actually, you know, moving towards construction. Mm -hmm. So you, you had noted earlier about this um, prioritization. List. So each member needs to uh, actually rank order. There are one, two, three, four, five top, and then they can submit additional ones. But w do you think it would be the case that um, it'd be really important as a strategic matter for people going to a member to have their essentially their objective be, I want to be on that. I want to be on that list of five and I want to be as high up on that list as I, as I can be. I mean, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. I mean, the fact that they asked for that, I think is something that's really important. And I know a lot of offices are taking that very seriously. Um, I think you definitely want to be in that member's top five. I mean, again, there's, you know, unanswered questions. I mean, do they, are they only going to take from the members top five? Are they going to consider other things? How are they, you know, if they decide they're going to give members between 10 and $20 million each and can the member come back with, you know, projects that were not necessarily in their top five. And we don't know the answer to that, but clearly there's a reason they're asking for that. And I think it's so that members are putting a lot of thought in both on the front end, working with their community and the groups that are they're, that are bringing the projects forward and then making their decisions about how they want to prioritize the ask they're going to make of the committee. So I think there is real value in making sure that you, you know, make that top five, um, you know, where that goes once they have submitted you know, and rank those top five projects. If they submit another 20 projects, you know, how that plays out, you know, well, it's not clear, but I think there's clearly a value and a reason that they're are asking members to put that kind of thought in on the front end before they actually submit projects. Mm -hmm. So let, let's turn to the question of matches, right? So in a normal um, federal transportation project, the, the general rule is 80% federal, 20% state or local. Match, but tell, tell us more about how match requirements will work in the context of MLX. I'm sorry, was the last part you trailed off? How match uh, requirements will work in the context of your marks? Yeah, I mean, they will follow the federal aid rules and, you know, that roughly 80-20, um, you know, which is kind of shorthand, but there are certain activities that could be up to 100%, um, certain safety activities in particular, um, you know, and there may be, um, in states that have a lot of federal lands, you might be up to a, you know, a higher, you know, they call sliding scale federal share, but the shorthand is it's going to follow the federal aid rules for that activity. And, um, you know, it'll be roughly that 80, 20% um, federal local match uh, split. Mm -hmm. So if you're um, from a municipality that wants to put forward a project and you um, are commit, you know, you've made a, you have the political will, you have the, the sense you want to, um, you know, provide that local match, it's worth it to you, you're, so you're ready to go forward. Just as a technical matter, do, do you have to um, already have budgeted those funds, you know, in your municipality, like how far do you have to be down the road in terms of actually committing uh, the local match funds? What, what qualifies? Let's see if I, uh, you know, I don't think they're very specific in that, um, but I think you need to be able to show them that you have that local support and you have dollars that are identified to be able to move forward. Um, because again, it goes back to that they want to see projects that are going to spend. I mean, in the past, there's been a lot of earmarks that didn't have that local commitment, didn't have any idea where their local match was coming from, um, and those dollars sat. 
Um, and I think they are trying to turn this a little bit on its head where you can show them that you have these dollars at least identified. I mean, I don't know specifically to your question about where, you know, how, you know, how, what is there a time frame by which you have to actually commit those funds? I don't think they specify that, um, but I just think they want to be able to be sure that they know that there's significant local support and the dollars have been identified and this project can move forward. Mm -hmm. All right, so for the next question, I might invite uh, Hal or Marianne to, to jump in as well. Uh, the, the question is whether there's any advice on messaging for members of Congress who are against earmarks and therefore hesitant to nominate or request projects, right? Because we've, we our advice in the way this process works is go to your member of Congress with your project and uh, and see how that, uh, you know, see if they will move it forward. But what if it's a, what if your member uh, is not inclined uh, or at least has not been clear that they're willing to uh, engage in this practice? Uh, thanks for the question, Kevin. And I'm happy to take a stab at answering that, but I did want to circle back on the previous question. And just looking at the guidance from the TNI committee, uh, they specifically say in their booklet on how to submit an application for a priority project. Quote, funding does not have to be, quote, in the bank at the time of the request, but the specific sources must be identified and reasonably expected to be available within the obligation window. So the obligation window would be, you know, the period that the bill covers. So um, you're going to have to present a plan that shows how all the dollars for that particular phase that we're asking to fu be funded are uh, where they're going to come from, but they don't necessarily have to be all committed right now. Um, now to the political question, um, you know, it's, it's a, a great question because I uh, am working with uh, one client that wants to submit an earmark request and his member is a Republican member who has uh, already announced that they don't support earmarks and they're not gonna submit a request. Um, that was the conversation we had with them last week. And yesterday I got a, an email from the member's office saying they changed their mind and they're going to ask for requests. Uh, my guess is that as more and more offices begin to submit requests, that attitudes are going to change because they're going to see that members are in fact um, submitting requests and they don't want to be left out of the game. On the other hand, uh, one response that you might give a reluctant member who says um, they're not going to participate is to say, um, ask the question then whether or not they're comfortable with giving it up to the Biden administration to decide how the funds are going to be spent. Uh, my guess is the answer is no, and that will lead to a broader conversation. Right. Um, let me add to that. There are a number of Republicans who have actually signed a letter as a group and sent the letter to Speaker Pelosi saying, we will not accept any earmarks. I think possibly some of those under good community pressure would change their position, but it'll be difficult for them to do that if they have taken that very public position. And if it's your sense that they are adamant and unmovable, then you move to your other request of them, which is, well, if you cannot support earmarks, then will you support one of the three bills that we have going through Congress uh, that will fund these type of projects? The uh, bill for uh, increasing the transportation alternatives money, the bill for increasing our trails money, the bill for creating money for our connected uh, systems and ask them to co-sponsor all three of those bills if they won't do an earmark. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, turning back to you, Jim, the situation where there are multiple congressional districts um, that our project is in, what, uh, how is that handled? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to definitely love to see that, you know, that there's a lot of coordination with the community and with the members um, to bring those projects forward. Um, you know, I don't, 
I'm trying to think of this, how I wanted to answer this. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be hard for them to consider to do if if you got one member asking for it and another member who doesn't want it. I think that's going to be very difficult um, if it's not in that member who's requesting its district. So that kind of coordination. In fact, that's one of the reasons why earmarks may have went away. There were earmarks that were being placed in members' districts who did not want them, but others did. And so I think that coordination amongst the members and that demonstrated community support is something that would be beneficial um, so that the, those requests are coming forward in a, in a unified way. Um, and that certainly the member whose district that, that segment of the project would be in is going to be supportive of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way I understand it is if you do have two willing uh, members of Congress in a, a project in two districts, you just ask uh, those two offices to coordinate, submit the project with the same name and to yes. uh, assign the cost relevant to each, each district. Yes. And then the committee can recognize that as a single project in two districts supported by both districts. So that's the happy circumstance. And then the, yes. you're, you're- Yeah, I'm sorry, I focused on the, the negative. The challenging <laughs> circumstance. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should try to be more of a glass half full guy, but I'm- <laughs> Okay. So, uh, so this question is, um, when you have a project that's in a, um, in a long range plan, but it's uh, not in the, t in the tip, not in the, um, uh, so, such as a segment of a regional trail network, you know, sort of how, how, is, uh, how does that affect the request? Well, I think, you know, they're gonna wanna see something that from, you know, the, the MPO um, that they, they could add that project to the tip or the stip, um, if it were to receive funding, um, you know, obviously, you know, they have to be financially constrained. So, if they don't have the funding identified, kind of going back to Hal's point on the local match, if they don't know how they're going to fund the project, they don't want to put it in the in the in the tip or the stip. So, they're going to want to see it either be in there or have some kind of a, a you know letter stating that they it, it can be added um, and can move forward. Um, so there, you don't, you know, it doesn't have to be in the tip or stiff, but there is a way to do that. That said, if you can't get that kind of a, um, a letter or acknowledgement, then it's going to be very difficult, I think, from the committee perspective, because uh, that project could very likely end up sitting out there. And it demonstrates, frankly, that there's a lack of community support um, to, to advance the project. It doesn't mean that people don't support the project. They just, you know, they've got other priorities and it's just not something they see moving. In the, in the relative near term, because the focus here uh, from the committee perspective is the near term. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jim, I know your time is limited. Do you, is there anything that you would like uh, the audience to know about this process that we haven't asked you before, before we lose you? Uh, no, no, I think we've covered a lot of the topics. I mean, I think, you know, I've been kind of stressing this and, you know, they're, they're you know, the, the members, uh, you know, they, they want to make sure that members of Congress have the ability to be responsive to their communities. Um, but they also want to make sure that what, what they're included in the bill are, are, are real uh, transportation projects um, that are going to have true community benefits. And so the more folks can work with their MPOs and, and other community groups um, and with their members to bring forward uh, positive projects that are on a path towards, um, towards you know, construction. Um, I, I think, you know, that's what the committee's looking for. Um, I think this is an opportunity to, to re, you know, invigorate the earmark process. Um, it could also be, um, if, you know, if, if it's not handled the right way and if good projects don't come forward, um, it could be, you know, the death of the earmark project or earmark process going forward. So the, the more people can work with within their communities to bring forward good projects, particularly trial projects, um, that, you know, this is an opportunity for those folks to work together and demonstrate their value um, and really, you know, and particularly in this current environment, um, hopefully be able to secure funding for trial networks that can demonstrate the value they can bring to communities, uh, to climate change, equity, and all the things that the administration and folks in Congress are looking for. So, um, you know, that would be the one thing I would, I would definitely want to leave folks with. I, I think this is a real opportunity and, um, you know, 
I, I, you know, I, 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 you know, members definitely want to do this. They want to, they want to include these things and they want to do them right. So, um, with that, I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm sorry I have to leave early, but uh, I'm happy to do any follow up. Hal knows probably more about this stuff than I do. So, um, and so does I know Marianne does. So, <laughs> um, so, but appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Well, thanks for being with us today. Absolutely. Hi, Jim. Okay. Yeah. Bye. So, so now we're going to uh, turn to Hal and Marianne. Um, before I do so, I just I do want to um, reiterate. Um, the importance of the, the combination of you can um, use this earmarking process to take a particular project that you have now that's ready to move forward and, and for which you could convince your member to, to back it. It's a good opportunity to get money for that project at this time. But uh, we know from working with all of you around the country that, uh, that you've got bigger plans. You've got, you've got multiple segments you want to do, you have, uh, projects at different points in the, in the pipeline, some you know, just now being conceived, some being planned, some being engineered and so on, and then some ready for construction. And so um, we, we, we think it's just critical that you have resources over time that are focused on what you need to put that, uh, put that whole network uh, together. And so uh, that, that's why you know, we've been emphasizing that your pitch to your member of Congress be not only about this earmark you want now, but to also be about the policy change you think we need to, uh, to back that up and to give you the opportunities to, to get that network built over time. So that's why we, we suggest that, that that combination of the, uh, of the, um, the uh, connectivity bill for building active transportation systems and an earmark that, uh, that you show them in, the, in real time, what does that look like for your community? Here's our big plan. Here's the project I want you to give me an earmark for. Here's how that one contributes to the big picture. It puts your project for earmark in a better light to be able to show that it's part of something bigger and gonna have a big impact. So, so we think that it's, it's in everybody's interest to, for us to be uh, all approaching members of Congress with that kind of story. So with that said, let's, let's turn to the priority setting process here, uh, Marianne and Hal, um, you know, basically, um, you know, th this is a process in which you approach a member and, uh, and uh, it's a competition against all kinds of transportation, right? It's just, they, you know, they'll be approached by people who want to build roads, bridges, transit facilities, et cetera, right? So it could be a very stiff competition. What, what is your best advice for people about how to approach it? <laughs> All right. Well, um, I will want to take one step back on the competition question and emphasize that within the appropriation process, um, and Jim talked a little bit about this, but each member is only allowed 10 appropriation requests across 12 appropriation bills. And so that means not only is your trail project competing against other transportation projects. It's also competing against um, juvenile justice requests for um, education requests for health and human services kinds of projects that might be requested, uh, interior appropriation requests. So uh, the project has to be pretty compelling to be one of the 10 projects that your member of Congress is actually going to submit. Um, and my guess is that each member will probably focus uh, on two or three or four appropriation um, uh, bills. Uh, so that might mean that they might submit one or two, maybe three transportation, housing, urban development requests. So that's the universe that you're working in within the appropriation cycle. And if uh, past experience uh, demonstrates the way that, that the members are likely to go and the, and the subcommittees are likely to go. The appropriation earmarks are going to be in the range of a few hundred thousand dollars or maybe even a little less um, to maybe a million, million and a half. So we're not talking about really huge amounts of money in the, on the appropriation side. I think on the reauthorization side, 
the opportunities are a little bigger. But one of the nice things about bicycle pedestrian trail projects is that you can actually do quite a lot for a million dollars. So uh, these projects are, are likely to be uh, competitive from the, the funding angle. As far as being competitive from a political perspective, I think um, just like any trail project that you've had to sell to the local uh, <clears throat> community uh, or uh, town council or county commission um, or state DOT, you've had to really emphasize how that project advances um, mobility, how it advances community uh, development, how it advances um, transportation choice. And I would really emphasize those points and make sure that those points as well as equity and, and, uh, and, and knitting a community back together that might have been uh, torn up through past poor transportation investments, um, how this trail project helps to do that. Uh, those are the kinds of arguments that I would think a member of Congress will respond to. Marianne? Um, I think we're getting into the area now of what we would call the art of the earmark. Because yes, you want your, your application for your project to cross all the T's and dot all the I's in terms of all of the eligibilities and qualifications and what have you. After that, you're selling it to the member of Congress. And like Hal said, there are different things that different members of Congress are more interested in, will be more responsive to than others. One thing we know they are all responsive to is the level of appreciation they're going to get if they choose your earmark. And also what kind of uh, public expression of that appreciation you can subtly suggest you might be providing to them. And I'll use as an example, um, being at a conference with a member of Congress from Texas so back in 2004 or five in that, in, when we were doing safety loop. And we, he was flanked by Lance Armstrong's mother and me. And so I broached the question of, of earmarks and he started talking about highway interchanges and what have you. And uh, anyway, by the end of the conversation, he had decided to use all of his earmark money for bike ped trail projects because he realized the incredible positive profile that would give him in his district. And so that is part of what you have to do is you have to find where, where is the sweet spot with this member of Congress and who else in the community does that person listen to? Uh, we actually have an example of a member that we were uh, working on getting to be a sponsor of a bill where we had his neighbors encountering him when he was walking his dog in the neighborhood urging him to, to um, be, be supportive. So once you've got the details of your application under control, then go for your, the, the soft side of getting an earmark. But the important thing is to get your earmark, regardless of how big or small it is, to get it in the top five priorities. And I would, the importance of getting it in the top five priorities and the importance of of getting a commitment from your member of Congress to submit the request within the next two weeks, uh, which is an unbelievably uh, narrow uh, window to actually make the application. On the House TNI committee, only the members can make these requests and um, on your behalf. And uh, they, the window for them to make the request to the committee opens on April 1st and it closes on April 16th. So that's your window. And um, you know tomorrow's the 1st of April. So uh, we're talking a very narrow uh, amount of time when you, you will be able to actually uh, have these conversations with the members of Congress. Uh, um, obviously, the sooner you get them the information, the answers to the 26 questions that are on the um, project designation in instruction booklet from the House TNI committee, uh, the more likely it is that they're gonna feel comfortable uh, submitting your request as one of their top five. But uh, that means that there's a lot of work to be done between now and the 16th. Mm -hmm. 
So what role do transportation officials play in this process and in the prioritization, right? You've got state DOTs, you've got the metropolitan planning organizations, you've got local transportation agencies, transit agencies, right? With all some official duties. Um, what, what do you see as, um, you know, what's your best advice to our audience in terms of how they um, engage with those entities and how those entities are likely to be engaging with the member of Congress? Well, one of those uh, types of agencies is um, the agency that will have to become the project sponsor. So the individual trail advocacy group cannot be the project sponsor uh, for a transportation infrastructure committee request. Um, there, there, within the appropriation cycle uh, on the appropriation side of community project funding, uh, private uh, nonprofit groups can submit, well, the submission has to come through the member of Congress as well, but, but private nonprofit organizations are eligible project recipients. But within the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, it has to either be the state DOT, um, the local MPO, the county, the city, it has to be an entity like that as, your, as who is actually making the submission. So uh, for trail advocates or bicycle pedestrian advocates, you have to come up with a partnership that um, you can talk about and make sure that that partnership is clear to the member of Congress because it's on behalf of that partnership uh, that the member of Congress will submit the request. Mm -hmm. And so Marianne, on the, on the art of the earmark piece uh, related to this, right? I have certainly heard from many congressional offices that the voice they hear most clearly on transportation questions is, uh, is their state uh, DOT head, right? So, so what, what do you see as the, the role of these agencies if you're you know, basically trying to run a, a mini advocacy campaign to put forward your, your earmark? Well, I think that the TNI members will listen to them. And certainly if you have the support of your state DOT, um, it will be a huge plus in terms of your project getting selected. So when you're doing your rounds of, of soliciting, lining up your supporters, I would definitely not ignore the state DOT, but you would have to think of reasons why the state DOT would have an interest in your project. So it's not just support my project, it's what's in this for both, both of us. Also, just a cautionary note, um, in looking at the 2005 earmarks, I was amazed at how many members of Congress who got those earmarks in 2005 are no longer sitting in Congress, haven't been there for years. And we know there are examples of where a member of Congress got an earmark, and I can name the rail trail on Long Island, got an earmark, great earmark for a trail, and that member was defeated in the state DOT, not only did not pursue that earmark, uh, they buried it. The new member of Congress didn't even know it existed. Uh, and then we had a big powwow with New York, New York DOT and the Congress, new Congress was represented, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we got that one moving. But if you've got state DOT invested from the beginning, you're much more, your earmark is much more likely to make it across the finish line, not just get selected, but actually get implemented. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a question about um, the level of match as it relates to the competitiveness of your request, right? So we, we heard from Jim, you know, the 80-20 rule, things like that. But, but uh, the question is, if you come forward to the member and say, well, we, we're willing to put more skin in the game than, than is what is required, does that make you more competitive? I think the answer would be yes. Um, the more you can show local support, whether the, um, the local match is coming from a private source, from the local uh, governmental entity or from the state, uh, just makes it a more compelling case that this is a project that has real legs and that um, the federal um, priority project funding out of TNI or community project funding out of appropriations uh, helps advance the project. So I think that's a, a strong selling point. 
I think you'd be a little bit careful with that because that's almost saying them that's got gifts uh, and we have a lot of communities in this country who would not have an ability to make offer to provide more of the local match and that those tend to be economically challenged communities, rural communities, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that, that, I mean, TNI's made it very clear they're gonna be very sensitive to equity issues uh, in this selection process. So it, um, I, I don't have a definitive answer on that one. Mm -hmm. So does it make a project more competitive if a uh, collaborative of partners or a coalition comes forward with the request as opposed to, um, you know, individual requests by individual organizations? Yes, I think so, because that shows broad-based support. That's one of the things that TNI is looking for. That's one of the things your member of Congress is looking for. And keeping in mind that you have to have that public entity part partner uh, with the, um, on the, on the TNI earmark. But yes, the broader base of support you have, the better chance you have of, of being prioritized and selected. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. And I think that is a particularly uh, important point to emphasize uh, because there was a lot of debate about whether uh, earmarks were gonna come back in both the appropriations or in the reauthorization uh, process this year. And one of the, um, the real selling points was that, that the Democratic leadership was going to insist on broad community support for these projects. And so the more you can emphasize that point, the more it uh, helps the member uh, feel uh, confident in that uh, level of broad support, but it also helps the committee, whether it's the Appropriation Committee or the TNI Committee, uh, feel like they're not going to be left hanging out on a project that they selected that didn't actually have the broad community support that uh, they were being told. Mm -hmm. Is a different kind of question. Is there a time limit on spending the funds? That is a good question. And uh, my colleague, Jim, uh, Cole would have been a, a more experienced person to answer this because he worked on the committee and understands the obligation uh, process a little bit more. But generally, uh, based on what the guidance that I've read from the committee suggests, it has to be within the, the uh, time frame of this reauthorization bill, which is a five-year bill. Mm -hmm. I think that's good as a general rule. On the other hand, um, we were able to resurrect the 2005 earmark 13 years after it was approved. Uh, New York, New York DOT maintained that that money had lapsed. And I said, no, that money didn't lapse. Some other money lapsed. This money is still there. <laughs> they, they finally conceded that that money was still there. But the reason they conceded that money was, was still there was because of the broad-based community support, including the fact that this particular trail went right through the, along the way where one of Governor Cuomo's top aides lived. So. But, yeah, I thought it was interesting, though, as soon as it was uh, announced that earmarks would be reinstated, the big story I saw in the paper, though, was uh, criticizing that some of the earmarks from way back when were still hanging out there, right? So it, I think it's maybe a vulnerability to the practice if that happens too often. I think that's right. And so uh, the more competitive projects are going to be projects that can spend the um, priority project funding uh, sooner rather than later. And, and that doesn't mean get to construction sooner rather than later, because it could be a phase of the project, which is an environmental phase or a planning phase that uh, the project is seeking funds for. But that particular phase of the project needs to advance um, sooner rather than later to, uh, I think, have serious consideration in this process. It's going to be so competitive this year and the committee is going to be so anxious about um, bringing back this process after 10 years of, uh, well, 15 years on in the, the case of, of reauthorization of not having earmarks. So they're going to be very anxious about whether or not those funds can be spent. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, going deeper into the project phase, right? So clearly you're allowed to apply uh, for various phases of, of project development, but from a competitive standpoint, are you more likely to prevail with your member of Congress coming forward with a construction project, which for, there might be a ribbon cutting, you know, near, sooner rather than later and what have you, or uh, versus say a design project? My answer to that is ribbon cuttings probably trump um, planning documents. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, if there's something really, really special and, and grabbing about the, the project that needs the design work, uh, that could give it a leg up. So again, we're going back to what are the qualities that your project has? Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a question. Uh, we have actually a couple of questions uh, about improving or, or maintenance, right? One question was about, you know, could the funds be used for the type of maintenance where maybe you're doing a, an overlay to, uh, you know, to improve the condition of a trail? And then a similar question was about improving an existing project for, such as paving an unpaved trail. So what, what, what do you think about those kinds of projects? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question because we are absolutely committed to uh, maintaining our roads. But when we start talking about maintaining our trails, it sort of flips. Uh, and there's a question about availability of funding for maintaining trails. Everything that's eligible to be funded under Title 23 should be eligible to be funded in an earmark. And if you look at the uh, maintenance um, opportunities or eligibilities in, in um, section 206, which applies to the recreational trails program. There is a lot of maintenance uh, in there. However, it might be better if you characterize uh, like paving a trail as upgrading the surface of the trail for safety's sake or um, capping the surface of the trail for, uh, to, for environmental protection in other words, give it some reason. This is it not, because routine maintenance is almost never accepted relative to trails. But prevention of environmental degradation or accomplishment of accessibility or uh, safety issues are eligible. Okay. So I'm gonna pivot to a more political sort of question, which is, uh, are there more shoes to drop here? Are, is there going to be a round of Senate earmarking, for instance? Um, there, there is likely to be a round of Senate earmarking. Um, the uh, Republicans in the Senate have not taken a position on earmarking yet. The Democrats have announced that they will support community project funding, both in the appropriation, well, in the appropriation process they anticipate including uh, priority projects in reauthorization, although they haven't been totally clear on that. Um, our, our political read on it is, my political read is that the Republicans in the Senate may never come out with a clear uh, up or down position. They'll just be waiting with a project list in their hip pocket and once the bill goes to committee, I mean, to conference, they'll have their list to add in because it's unlikely that earmarks would come over and say a, a house uh, appropriation bill and then eventually go to conference with the Senate. And the conferees are only looking at democratic earmarks in the Senate and a combination from the house, but the, Republicans in the Senate would be left out of that conversation. And I just can't believe that they will be, uh, that they'll allow themselves to do that. So my sense is that there will be earmarks on the Senate side as well um, in both the appropriation and reauthorization processes. But um, they typically, their, their deadlines are later than the House. So we need to focus on the House right now. Mm -hmm. I think we're likely to get clear articulation on a process in the Senate appropriations um, decisions. And quite frankly, they've been kind of earmarking that appropriations bill all along. Um, but there is a desire to make that more transparent. I wouldn't be at all surprised if we didn't see EPW hang back. 
uh, in terms of establishing a formal process for earmark. Mm -hmm. So is there a list of members who are not pursuing earmarks? I, I actually have a list, I don't know how complete it is, or that of members who signed a letter to speak of Pelosi saying, we will not accept earmarks. So if anyone wants that, just send me an email and I'll be glad to send it to you. Fair enough. But I, I would emphasize, I think those members taking such a public position, it's unlikely that they are going to change that position and they kind of box themselves in. But uh, the member that I referenced earlier in the conversation uh, last week, absolutely, they were not going to submit. And yesterday I got an email saying, here's our process. So, uh, you know, they're changing their position. Mm -hmm. Marianne, we have a follow-up. You'd uh, given the uh, opinion earlier that uh, approaching as a, a collaborative or a coalition was a good thing. This uh, question is about, you know, if you've done that, do you leave it at that or do you uh, further uh, engage with other touches with the member's office to, uh, to reinforce the ads? Oh, you, you, you're going to be your member's best friend <laughs> for the next two weeks. Uh, and you have to be careful not to come at pets. Um, but you, you have to create a, a, a atmosphere of relationship where you're in this together. That they think it's in their best interest to, to prioritize or to get your earmark funded and you think it's your best interest. Well, that's what you're aiming for. And it's not, this is not just a one-off. You know, check in to see how the process is going. Check in to see if the deadline has been extended. Check in to see how they're doing. Check in to see what they named their baby. I mean, whatever works uh, to establish and strengthen that relationship. And keep in mind, this is a cultivation. This isn't just about this earmark. We used earmarks in 2005 to create supporters for bike, ped, trail, active transportation across the board. Um, a lot of members of Congress hadn't given it that much thought. They were surprised that there was this outpouring of support for earmarks of this type. So. This is a, an excellent way, particularly if you don't yet have a strong relationship with your member of Congress, or if you have a new member of Congress, to engage them in active transportation or bike pet trail issues. And then don't let that uh, contact that you've made go. You have to build on it, because there is always another day. Mm -hmm. So relationships are pretty important to the politics here, right? If you um, happen to know somebody that works for a member of Congress, even if they maybe don't handle this particular issue? Is that, is that a good point of entry for your conversation with the office? I think so. I, I think seeking their advice on, on how to best, how their office, that, that congressman's office or congresswoman's office is handling, um, asking for an introduction to the person on the staff that's handling the earmark process, any in you've got multiple ways of in, in getting in, go for it. Uh, I, I think that's exactly <laughs> right. I was on a Zoom call with a member of, a Republican member of Congress yesterday or, or uh, that member's legislative director. And, um, and we specifically outlined a project that uh, uh, is going to be submitted but to the appropriation and T-HUD appropriation bill. And we said to that legislative director, we know you have a big congressional district. We know you're going to have other transportation project requests. We can um, scale this particular request from a $200,000 request to a $400,000 request. We need some advice from you on what you think is going to most competitive, given what else you know is coming at you from around your congressional district. And we were trying to solicit the um, uh, uh, staffer to become a partner with us in the request as opposed to just throwing a big number at this particular staffer and hoping they'll respond. So that effort, I think, is, goes back to what Marianne was saying. Um, in the next two weeks, it's really critical to have these conversations, but don't stop there. 
because this appro appropriation process and reauthorization process is going to go on for months and uh, they won't make their final decision until May, June, and, uh, and then even into conference. And so this is a long process. You've got to stay engaged to make it successful. Great. Well, thank you, Hal and Marianne. We are at time, um, but I appreciated uh, your, your insights here. And I'm sure the audience has as well. And uh, we thank everybody for joining us today. <clears throat> we encourage you to look at the resources on our website that uh, were in the chat and to contact us with any other questions you have. And uh, we look forward to working with all of you uh, as this reauthorization goes forward. Thank you.